I'm leaving this in. <laughs> <laughs> People think li- Andrew normally wears pants when he's talking to us. <laughs> nah, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are his golf shorts. Are you taking the Mickey? <laughs> we did a little. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, Welcome to the common room. As you can see, we have already got going. Andrew has his best shorts on. He's shown us some of his legs, so I think it's time that we really Ooh. get down to business. Gentlemen. That is business. <laughs> <laughs> so in exciting podcast news, we have now passed our 300th episode, mm. which just kind of breaks my brain. I remember when we had three. Uh, wow. have, hey, David, have we passed the, like, the married couple stage of dying to the honeymoon phase in, in like... That was episode four. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you we had entered a honeymoon into- phase? <laughs> <laughs> I faked it for one, two, and three. <laughs> wow, wow. Bitter. Oh, no, so I bitter. got here, of course. Oh, and then it all became wonderful. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys have been busy with uh, a severe mercy month, so yep. I haven't spoken to you guys in a while. How do you think it's going? I think oh, it's I'm- going well. Yeah. Well, I think it's going well, but this, this one we're about to record after this episode three, the amount of quotes, the amount of like just wisdom that is in this last third of the book is absolutely insane. In the last chapter, honestly, I could have just read the last chapter and we could have just let it speak for itself. I mean, he really, I think that's probably why I loved it so much the first time is because all of a sudden you get the last chapter and it just like smacks you. And there's so much wisdom of him <laughs> reflecting on his life and his journey and his learning. So I cannot wait for our listeners to hear it. I'm assuming his common room is coming out before the third episode is released. So, yeah. yeah. Hmm. yeah. I have my Davies edition. Very nice. I showed people uh, on the microphone last time, <laughs> um, but I'm sure that they heard it. But so there's Davy and Van. And there's some other pictures of Davy mm-hmm. and Glenn Merle and Van and Davy up on the rigging and Davy and Van. So you don't get all these pictures in the paperback. And there's the, <laughs> one of her famous paintings. There she is, I think, in Hawaii. Um, let's see. Here's a letter from Lewis. And then how hard is that edition to get hold of? Uh, 40 bucks, something like that. Not too, okay. not too hard. I've seen it for, I mean, I, I swiped it for $40. I've seen it for 75, $80. And then, um, there's the sin painting. Oh, and I was just about to ask you to show that. Yeah. There's the shining barrier. Ah, the green tree that they're protecting. Yes, there it is. And then the sin picture. Ah, there we go. It's like Salvador it's a, Dali. Yeah. It, just needs yeah. a, it just needs a drooping clock and you've got him. <laughs> Salvador Davy. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. If you can find it, uh, it's it's worth it. Adds to the experience. And then the chime is these, um, these uh, <laughs> Eastern prayer bells. <laughs> it is a pretty incredible um, chime. Yeah. So there they are. Um, <sighs> yeah. So what else, fellas? Well, I thought that we should hand today's episode over to you because you've had a lot of changes in your life. And so I thought we would call this episode, What's New, Drew? <laughs> What's new is you can't see in the camera the boxes, the, the, the boxes that are on the floor and boxes everywhere. And Kristen's one of those who wants to be out of all of the boxes within the first week or two. Sensible and, woman. I'm yes, exactly the same. Is. Uh, we have surpassed that, but um, downstairs we're assembling a piece of furniture which will allow us to unpack the kitchen. So there's, you know, lots of muscle aches and all the rest. It's it's just the transition of of uh, of moving. Um, and tomorrow, let's see, let's see uh, the Florida DMV was amazing. Uh, we got our licenses in about twenty minutes. Um, nice. Wisconsin's I mean, the same. After California, it? it's so weird. You go in there, you hand in the form, they give you the stuff, you're done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they were, it was, I think it probably took an hour and a half total, including driving. 
uh, making appointments, everything to get our actual physical licenses in hand. The actual experience was super easy. And so we're going tomorrow to get our, uh, our new, new insurance kicks in. So we're going to go get our license plate. And I think uh, my Florida plate will say for Aslan. Um, it's been for <laughs> Narnia. And so I'll probably <laughs> take off those plates. Maybe we should auction off those plates to the, you know. Um, so I'll get, get, the, get our new plates tomorrow. And so lots of transitions. Um, a week from today, I'll start my new job as a s apprentice rector, uh, and eventually an assistant priest at uh, Church of the Messiah in Winter Garden, Florida, which is about, uh, I don't know, half an hour from Disney. Mm. So, so does that sounds mean I'll like have a, a place... Mickey Mouse post to me? Oh, yes. <clears throat> yeah. Does mean I'll have a I... place to crash so I can come to Disney World? As a matter of fact, right next door to me, right over here, we have um, Spare Oom. <laughs> um, and in Spare Oom, it's, uh, it's our Narnia room. So I've got all my Lewis First Editions, all of our different sets of Narnia, all my different editions of Till We Have Faces, all my, I've got half a shelf just for Patty Callahan. Um, and we've got all of my Tolkien and all of the Tolkien little figurines and my eagle and my second chapter of Acts, um, Roar of Love LP. Um, we've got a little lamp post. Um, so we got it. Uh, oh, the, the Bandersnatch picture of all of the Inklings um, mm -hmm. I have framed, and that's over the printer. And we have a queen mattress, uh, an inflatable queen mattress um, uh, in the bed. Very comfortable, highly, highly recommended. And so, yeah, we have a spare oom. Um, that, uh, you might that... have to pat guests down before they leave just to make sure <laughs> that all of the books and trinkets are still there. You mean as yeah, if there's not even. a wired security system that would go <laughs> off? If a book crosses that uh, it crosses the threshold of the of the door of the room, the alarms <laughs> go off. <laughs> so I had an interesting um, online conversation with folks. Um, I said, should I arrange my first editions chronologically? according to publication date or composition date. So for example, where do I put Boxen? Do I put Boxen in the 80s, 1980s, 1990s when it came out? Or do I put Boxen absolutely first? Because that was the first. So I don't know. What do you guys think I should do with my first? Besides give them all to you. <laughs> Matt, what I don't do you reckon? Box, I don't even know what Boxen is. Uh, Lewis and Warney um, had two different kind of imaginary lands that they created as kids. And so Warney's was called India because he was fascinated by, shockingly, India and loved boats and and ships. And uh, and Jack's was called um, Animal Land. And so he had these dressed animals. Um, so the, the ruler of that country was the Lord Big, who's a, a, a frog. Um in a waistcoat and, you know, uh, so they, and, but together animal land in India formed a land called Boxen and they mm -hmm. wrote an encyclopedia Boxonia. And Lewis also refers to in surprise by joy, burying all of their toys. Um, some of which appeared as characters in Boxen in little Lee in the garden. And he gives fairly specific directions about where it was. And so, um, I've thought about showing up at Little Lee in Northern Ireland with a shovel. Uh, I don't know if that would be a very well. Probably received. wouldn't end well. No. I think I would say probably publication. Uh, okay. Because I would expect uh, all of his unpublished works at the end of my shelf. Yeah. And so, so that means I should put Early Prose Joy in 2013, not in 1930. Mm hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I probably would have put him. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> How would I have done it? Knowing me, I would have grouped them by uh, topic. Color. I then might have Color. factored in, but no, I would have been like, <laughs> I would have obviously kept like the series, why the series and stuff, but I'd have like nonfiction in one area. I'd have fiction in the other area, his poetry. So I would probably go that way. I wouldn't actually mm. think about the date, but that's just me. And I'd be like, all right, I want to go, let me find one of his nonfiction books. Okay. We've got miracles. We've got... <clears throat> Uh, mere Christianity, and just pull that out, Four Loves. That's how I'd do it, actually. Well, if you or listeners uh, would like some help uh, arranging them in Matt's very bizarre and illogical, <laughs> uh, unhelpful way, um, 
uh, I have in the back of Mere Christians um, a list of Lewis's books categorically arranged. Um, and so, uh, and they can download that on my website, mythoflove.com for, or mythoflove.net um, for free. It's just one of the resources I've made available. So if you want to arrange, you know, buy those categories. Um, like a wise I, man. What I was very tempted to say was to quote the movie and the book High Fidelity. Yes. Um, yes. When he's, when he's arranged, when he's arranging them, it's like, how are you grouping them? Genre? Chronologically? He says, no autobiographically yes he does so in order girlfriend. to find the books you need to know when you bought it yes 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 that's pretty good well, i've done my uh i've done my lewis shelf these are my lewis readers copies right there um mm -hmm. so i've done those alphabetically um just so i can get to them and there you see some of the boxes um yeah laws is boxing um, but for the first editions i've done them in chronological order because sometimes I refer to them when I'm doing research. I want to know what the first actually had to say. Sometimes there are some differences. So, um, so, so that's just it. I'm, I'm thinking about what, you know, what starting this new job looks like. Um, mm -hmm. And what does that look like? Well, I have no idea. I'm a little curious real quick, Andrew. I don't know if this is opening up way too big of a can of worms. So sure. you, you only answered if you can do it in a few minutes, but. What has been your okay. journey to? I'll, we'll go on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Have we not met. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, it's, I realize this is about to be a massive question, but I'm not sure listeners sure. have ever heard. Like, what's your journey to becoming an Episcopal priest? Like, you, your Christianity. What denominations have you been in? If it's always been Episcopalian, and what someone them. led you to this? <laughs> yeah. All of them. What were things yeah. that you know really drew you to this one? You don't need to necessarily ding other ones per se, but like, what was it about this, and then ultimately yeah. feeling this call to the priesthood? Yeah. Um, so the first or second part of that, whichever it is, is uh, that's our that's my call narrative story. Um, and we get to the point uh, at the, you know, in seminary and spiritual autobiographies and all the rest where I can tell that fairly quickly. Um, uh, I went at one point to the Moody Bible Institute to become a missionary. And then I met real life missionaries. And I'm like, oh, one of these things is not like the others. <laughs> you know, they <laughs> clearly had a call that I did not have. Um, yep. So uh, I just wanted to be a good church, a churchman for um, you know, an informed parishioner. Um, I'm an Episcopal-Costitarian. So I was baptized by my Cuban father, uh, not by him, but you know, at his at his behest into the Catholic Church. Um, never remember going to church. I think I maybe went to church once or twice in my youth. Um, Became a Christian at 14, started going to my friend Wendy Einer's uh, father's Baptist church, uh, Pioneer Baptist, which is now still thriving. My best friend goes there. Um, Baptist church led me to really learn about the Bible. Um, and while I was at the Moody Bible Institute, I went to Jesus People USA, which is a Christian commune, like 500 people. Um, and they have a, you know, they would have a rock festival and the lead pastor was the lead guitar player in, in in a, in a Christian hard rock band, resurrection band or res band, um, wonderful church. And that was kind of an assembly of God charismatic. So I kind of got some of that, um, became a Presbyterian in Nashville, Tennessee at Christ community church, half of my record collection, uh, from my, all the Christian music I'd collected. Um, half of them went to half of my collection was sitting in the pews every Sunday. So Amy Grant did our Chris, uh, Christmas music, Michael Card led a Bible study, and that's where I met Phil Keggy. That's pretty um, sweet. Amy Grant's oh my phenomenal. Gosh. <laughs> it was incredible. It was incredible. Um the 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 music, the quality of music. So um it was Lewis that kind of led me to the Episcopal Church. Um I loved the Anglican tradition. Um even reading Severe Mercy had a bit to do with that, you know, and seeing their uh, conversion. Bob Weber's Robert Weber's Evangelicals on the Canterbury Trail was a piece of that. Um, and then um, about 20 years ago, my church really went through an upheaval with some issues about, you know, human sexuality and the uh, Presbyterian uh, one you're talking about still. No, or? I became an Episcopalian. Okay. In, at that point. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So I moved from Nashville um, back home to California to Sacramento. Um, and because of Lewis had been really drawn to the Episcopal church, um, to the Anglican tradition. And so my parish church was the cathedral in downtown Sacramento. And so I walked to church every Sunday. 
Um, there are little ladies who did the greeting ministry. You know, you fill out a visitor card. Uh, a couple of weeks later, uh, a couple of ladies from the visiting ministry would show up at your house to, you know, just say hello and drop off a pie as <laughs> part of, you know, their hospitality. So I joined that church three times. <laughs> The last one, I'm like, Blackberry, please. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not true. But um, but it was the, uh, once I got to the Episcopal Church, it kind of felt like home. But with some of the controversy um, in my church about some of these issues, um, uh, I just, I, I, I felt some disaffection. I felt, you know, I wondered if I could stay. I explored the Catholic Church. Uh, I know that this is not a sufficient answer. Um, I tried to get there um, and read a bunch of a bunch of stuff. I know that uh, Michael Ward will be disappointed in this answer. Holly Ordway would be disappointed in this answer. Both of you and our Catholic Catholic uh, 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 listeners. <laughs> um, I know that there can't be a sufficient answer um, for why I didn't make it. And I acknowledge that, but it really opened my eyes to a love of uh, the Catholic Church and the liturgical tradition um, and the saints and the Blessed Virgin and all of that stuff. Um, but I, and I read a bunch of books. I, you know, I read my Scott Hahn and um, talked with Catholic friends, lots of them, um, read um, Thomas Howard, uh, Lead Kindly Light and, you know, a bunch of that stuff and was firmly opened up to an embrace of the Catholic church, but couldn't quite get there. Um, and I remember talking to a, a, an Episcopal priest friend and he said, you know what, Andrew, God knows how to shout. Um, <laughs> and so then I spent a summer working, doing some work for Max McLean uh, in New York city and went to all angels on the upper West side, um, which is an Episcopal church. And mm -hmm. It just immediately felt like home. And so I said, okay, this is as close as I'm going to get. It's still part of the apostolic tradition. I'm going to, I felt like staying here. So it was a couple of years later um, that a friend of mine, Episcopal priest friend of mine, said that he would hire me as a teaching pastor in a heartbeat. I said, what do I got to do uh, to do that? <laughs> and he said, well, you have to get ordained. So um, I really want it to be Homer Simpson's answer. It's like, so what do I have to do? Wail on some Unitarians? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, that was part of my tradition. My my mother took us to Unitarian Church a few times growing up. Oh, um, I was nonplussed. Um, so uh, the the Diocese of Texas, the Episcopal Diocese of Texas has a discovery weekend, which is kind of an explore what vocation looks like. And they paraded all kinds of, you know, bivocational priests, deacons, lay ministers. Um, and I really kind of felt convicted that priesthood was, was the way to go. When I told my bishop, Bishop Andy Doyle, that I was thinking about going to this weekend, he said, well, it's about time, don't you think? <laughs> um, so he had invited me to talk about Narnia to the clergy conference uh, in the diocese. And I said, how do you talk to a bunch of priests? He said, well, just do what you normally do at a Lewis talk, except swear more. <laughs> said, I have found my people. <laughs> so have I ever uh, heard you swear? I don't think I have. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> as a respect to big law. <laughs> I, I need to, to make my way. <laughs> I need to make my way down to Florida. Yes, you do. A couple scotches and it'll come out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Suggest um, that Narnia should be read in chronological order. See what happens. <laughs> I just had that conversation with my brother-in-law yesterday. <laughs> but um, the the discernment process, the vocational process, once I expressed that to folks, Kristen said, look, you love talking with kids who just broke up with their girlfriend or sitting in the stands with, you know, with parents and, you know, discussing their kid. You don't really love, you know, talking about dangling modifiers and grading papers. And um, and you know, she and everybody else in my life had almost an immediate reaction of, oh, yeah, that sounds like you. Even my aunt, who's not a believer, um, said, oh, yeah, I've always thought of you as a minister. Um, mm -hmm. And so there was enough resonance. And then the process happened fairly quickly. So from the, from the discovery weekend uh, to seminary was about a year and a half. 
Um, so I went through the diocesan process and the local parochial process. And so um, now having finished up seminary a month from, month and a half or so, uh, from Saturday, I'll, on the 25th of June, I'll be ordained a deacon in the Episcopal Church. And about six months later, God willing, I'll become a priest. And hopefully by then I'll finish my Northwind degree. But well, that's, that's really good timing because we'll be starting season six in December. So we'll we'll be able to start with Advent, a sense of preparation and anticipation for both yes. Christmas and uh, you becoming a, a doc finally becoming a doctor now that your wife has been one for ages. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> She surpasses me in many ways, but you know what, David, you and I both know about marrying way up. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that, yeah, that'll be good. I'm, I'm hoping maybe it'll happen on the Feast of Epiphany. Um, the, the rubrics are, um, uh, the, the canons are six months after ordination to the priesthood. So six months from, or to the diaconate. Um, and so six months is Christmas, but I don't think the bishop wants to come out on Christmas and, uh, but that would be really funny if today we celebrate the arrival of the three wise men. They couldn't be here today, but instead, <laughs> yeah, but Andrew, <laughs> we have their opposites here. <laughs> Here's what a fool looks like. Um, so, uh, all of this, you know, and starting my job, you know, next week, and a, a lot of that is question marks. You know, it's going to be interesting. I imagine that some of it will be hospital visits and. You know, there's work to do around the church. Um, my job is to enliven some current ministries and to start new ones as appropriate. Um, and I've got, thanks to my rector, just real wide freedom to do, um, to continue speaking. When I told him about Oxbridge, you know, I'm going to become your deacon. And then three weeks later, I'm going to go to England for three and a half weeks. There's like, cool, <laughs> just bring back all the good stuff. So, um, <laughs> So it's a lot of question mark about what that's going to look like. Um, my priest has raised up a number of rectors, um, and that's what that's kind of where his passion is, is to is to have apprentices and to teach them priestcraft. He's been at this church for 25 years as mm -hmm. a priest, which is pretty unusual. So, but it's got me thinking about transitions. Um, and you did you want... did by the way you did a phenomenal job keeping that under three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> under 30 minutes. <laughs> I you have no idea out. the editing and the detail that I've left out of all of that. <laughs> um, but I want to think about transition. You all, you both have had some tra transitions in the last couple of years. Um, having a kid, moving, you know, I know, Matt, you did some significant traveling. And um, I want to just think about out loud, you know, just hear your thoughts about what are the blessings, what are the dangers of transitions? What do you, ha how do you handle them? What it reveals about you? How do I be deliberate? You know, how are we deliberate about what's coming next? And just kind of wanted to toss that out to you both. Well, I have many thoughts. <laughs> as, <laughs> really? As someone that's had a lot of transitions. Keep it under three life. minutes, David. Yeah. T time me, watch this. Um, <laughs> you know, I've, I've changed countries, I've changed jobs uh married kid so i've had a lot of transitions and when i first came to the states the thing i'd often say to people is um when you change a lot of things in your life you get to see what is unchanging what is eternal when everything is changing mm -hmm. around you and years before i'd watched a documentary on um buddhist monks and some of them take a kind of pilgrimage where they try and keep moving the entire time and it's with that idea that with everything changing around them, they would get to see past it to the things that were eternal. And definitely through all of my changes, it, it's, it's always highlighted what is core, what is essential and, you know, what is eternal. Uh, and the other thing that I would say about all of those changes, it reminds me of the, the gate liturgies at the temple and you have them also in liturgical churches. Very often things happen at doorways. That's where things mm -hmm. often happen. Mm -hmm. Um, and about how those can be really powerful moments of personal development um, and renewal. Uh, to put it in secular terms, it's, it, it's, the, it's the time when you can reimagine yourself, uh, invent a new self. You know, when someone's going from middle school to high school, well, you know, that's often a time when people will very, be very deliberate about some of their life choices, uh, considering what sort of person that they want to be. 
And at each of those transitions in my life, I, I've seen that I, I've got a decision to make, you know, as I'm going to university, am I going to continue practicing my faith? Um, as I move to the States, what is life now going to look like? Cause I've got a completely blank slate. What are my interests? So many of them are up for grabs when I'm getting married, when I'm having a child, what kind of husband do I want to be? What kind of father do I want to be? What kinds of things am I going to set up? for this new era in my life. Under three minutes. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Well this done, I guess too. Um, honestly, I would have echoed a lot of that. So I would take a little bit of a sub point. As somebody who's also experienced the transitions from like when my year abroad to San Diego, to New York, to back to here, um, transitions reveal, I think two things. One, they can reveal your idols mm. and it can be very easy in a space, I'm the king of routine. So I'm not trying to bash routine. I think routine is a beautiful thing, but I think routine can become an idol. Mm -hmm. And there's a power to a routine when it's used for the right ends. And there's, there's a negative to routine when it becomes like the thing that creates your sanity, the thing that creates your peace. It's like, God is your, your home. Routine's not your home. Mm -hmm. And so I have witnessed when, when my life is in transition, my routine gets broken and I see how much I can sometimes become dependent on that, rigid on that. And that can prevent me. And the danger is when it's, when I don't really see how much it's preventing me from loving other people properly. Mm. I mean, I can get so caught up in my routine. It's about like preserving my sanity to get what I think needs to be done on my time. And it's like, mm -hmm. God is appending that. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a really beauty in the idol, idol side of things of revealing that. But now to kind of promote a little bit routine, I also think it reveals an importance of finding home when you get to a new place. So when you get mm -hmm. into a transition, I also recognize one of the first things I got to do is like find that church community because that's just super important. So when I have been in transition, I'm more speaking to geographical transitions in this case, but it's always been very critical. If I go to a new place and I don't, I don't have an intentionality in like mm -hmm. resetting up my life, it's, it's a danger as well. And I can get caught in that limbo almost. Um, mm -hmm. and I don't think you want to be like caught in it per se, um, unless it's God's intention, but yeah, yeah those would be the two comments I'd have to say, mm -hmm. I guess around that. But I would, my first one would have been David's. I think that's a very important thing too. Yeah. I think Kristen's struggling. I think we're both struggling because she's got her office, um, pretty well set up and she's got some writing to do. Um, you know, I, it's, it was very interesting to kind of pick which Lewis pictures to put where and <laughs> when and how, and there's some more on the wall. And, you know, th there's the one that you all gave me, um, which was one of the first ones to, to go up and, you know, kind of sorting out the world. I, I'm not a routine guy. I like remaking and remaking decisions again and again. Um, drives Kristen That mad. sounds terrible. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's gonna oh, be yeah. Cool. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And, and I married somebody for whom that's just, that's one of the sacrifices uh, that she makes in loving me. Um, and so we're trying to get to a place where do we know what the space is going to look like? You know, can we, can we, get, you know, can we, you know, it's been a liminal time. It's been an uncertain time. And then some of that is kind of, you're holding, I'm holding my breath. You know, I don't know what the new job is going to look like. I don't know what the hours are going to be exactly. I, I get to decide what my day off is. Um, I asked my rector um, if it would be okay if I took Sundays off and he was nonplussed <laughs> <laughs> that idea. He said, I'm not sure that you may need another couple of years of seminary. If you... It's the Lord's day, not yours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I am a child of the Lord. And so, um, so yeah, there's this, uh, I love what you said, Matt. Um, and, and you too, David, to kind of lean on what's unchanging and the revelation of idols. The whole move has been chaotic because we've been packing up for over a month, you know, living out of suitcases and all the rest. And I found myself getting really irritated really easily and tones of voice, you know, that whole thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. And Kristen and I have kind of found in the middle of that, this, you know, they say in recovery, how important is it? So these kind of moments of, okay, I'm just bugged, but I'm bugged because it's just irritating. This is a difficult thing, you know, and 
we have learned how to let things go. I think in a way there's a whole gear. You're nodding, David. Tell me. Oh, yes. Oh, just, I would say that's the chief skill in marriage. Communication is right up there, but I'd say first and foremost, it's just learning to let stuff go. Mm -hmm. You, you, You have joined yourself to another person who is not you. Therefore they have different ideas, different expectations, different lots of things, no matter how weird they are. And sometimes you just go, that's weird. That's stupid. I wouldn't do it like that, but fine. Aren't you superior, David? No, no. I'm just saying that's weird and that's different. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, and that's, I think a gift of this kind of chaos is, you know, I, I realize again and again, just how much of a treasure she is and how much I love her. Um, but I don't treat her like that for much of the day. And so there's lots of, Hey, I was being a jerk or, Hey, you were being a jerk, but it doesn't matter that much. And let's, you know, let's see what we can do to let that go. And, you know, um, the, the, the final thing I would maybe say about transitions is they are an opportunity. Mm-hmm for God and for Satan. Mm -hmm. Um, It's been, and and I think the difference is what you make of it, how you look at it, how you view it, how much you turn to God, how much you depend on him. There's been times where I've struggled in transitions and I'll go to priests, I'll go to confessions and they'll literally ask me what kind of season in life. I'll be like, Oh, I just moved from here. Okay. All right. And then they'll give me very different advice. And it's like here, you know, this is, this is a window of opportunity for Satan to enter in and to try to pull you away in certain ways. It's Screw also tapes an oppor- move. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's also an opportunity for you to develop a deeper intimacy with God as your centeredness, as everything else is in chaoticness. And so it's an mm-hmm. opportunity. And I think if you look at it that way and attempt to look at it as a chance to grow closer to God and really stay vigilant about the preventing Satan, I think that's a, a way to approach it. Yeah. David? I was David just thinking of, li- of, Lewis's, of Lewis's line where he speaks about getting up each morning and beating back all of the, yes. all the things that rush upon you. That I is think, why I the think... real problem of the Christian life does, comes not where you usually look for it. It comes the very moment you uh, get up every day. And your first job is to, you know, and the, all the day with its wild wish, hopes and expectations rush or all the day with its hopes and rush at you like wild animals. And the first job every day consists in simply pushing them back. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. Mm-hmm. And then he says, and that's the challenging bit, and so on all day, right? To keep turning away from the wind of the of the chaos and keep turning to. Yeah. So well, and I'm also realizing that, you know, screw tapes work in overtime, especially because I'm about to enter into ordained ministry and church ministry. I mean, I went to the men's dinner on Tuesday night. It's like the cure of souls, these souls depends on me. Like my job is to care for these people in a spiritual way. It's like they got the wrong guy. (laughs) You know, I feel very inadequate to it, you know, but um, Jesus did great things with fishermen. So, you know, teacher could probably do a thing or two. Yeah. Well, we are over half an hour, so I'm going to pull this one to a close. Uh, and since we're talking about habits, uh, I have recently got a Peloton. Uh, so if anybody wants to nice. friend me on Peloton, uh, my username is my full name, David Lewis Bates. Come find me, race with me, um, send, send me horrible workouts because I'm just doing all of that to Matt. If I, if I do a workout that really destroys me, first thing I do as soon as I'm off that bike is to send it to Matt and tell him to do it. <laughs> I, I need to do one. The problem is I've been, um, I'm now done with that huge work project as of Tuesday officially. And so Transition I've been, points. I've been like, yeah, oh. I know. Um, and it's also nice weather. So I'm now more into, since I have a little bit more time, I'm not doing quick 15 minute Peloton workouts. I'm going for like 30, 45 minute runs in the nice weather. So I haven't Peloton for a couple of weeks now. I need to get back on it. Ooh. Well, I'll close with this kind of word of wisdom I pulled from, uh, from, from recovery. They would often say it's progress, not perfection. Um, and then somebody put a spin no, on that it's and says, it's process, not outcome. Cause even that if that's so outcomes, true. Yeah. So it's still part of another process. So, and thank you. Teresa Lord. said faithfulness, not success. Ah, there you go. Good. 
Well, it's great catching up with you. Sorry I missed last time. I missed you all, but it seems like the chaos is starting to, you know, if there's no chaos at this level. It's only on the ground level with the boxes there. But um, but we're getting that taken care of. So. Wonderful. Well, Gentlemen. pleasure, gentlemen. Cheers. 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 I think it's I think it's the look that gets me even more every time. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>